Hey folks, welcome to episode four of the spring 2021 season of the podcast. I hope that you are enjoying what's been going on so far uh, and also episode 119 of the podcast. It seems like a lot all of a sudden. Every now and then I have these moments where I'm like, wow, there's so many episodes. I've been doing this for so long. And I want to take a moment here before we get going to ask you to support the podcast. All right. I feel like one of those uh, old time uh, tele- telephone marathon TV things. Please support the shows. Please make sure that we can continue to deliver uh, quality programming. But really what I'm saying here is please help make sure that people can access this programming by supporting the podcast. The links for doing it are in the show notes through Buy Me Coffee or some other options in order to make sure that transcriptions are available so that everybody can enjoy the content here and learn what's going on. Imagine if you had uh, found out about this podcast and heard people talking about it, but were completely unable to uh, access it because the only thing available was the audio. We really want to make sure that everybody can get to this material and providing transcriptions is the way for that to happen. So jump in, make it happen. There are literally... Uh, about 1,500 people who listen to every episode of this podcast, and uh, so far we're at less than 10 people who've uh, made that step. So please don't put it off. Uh, please jump in and support this. Let's make this work accessible to everybody because uh, I think it's important. I certainly, if you're continuing to listen, you must think it's important. Um, so let's share that around and make sure that people can get access. All right, on with the show, folks. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of The Hermit's Lamp. I am here today with Stacking Skulls. Uh, Stacking Skulls is Fabeku Fantomisi and Aiden Wachter and myself, Andrew McGregor. And, uh, you know, this is our fake occult rock band. We uh, recorded a couple of podcast episodes together and uh, somewhere along the way, the name stuck and we have just kind of continued with it ever since. So we, uh, we release no music. We have no actual albums. Uh, none of us are even like playing music in this arena right now, but what we do is we get together and just talk about life and magic and, you know, whatever's going on. Uh, as Aiden pointed out before we started recording this podcast, this is the third episode during uh, lockdown or during the pandemic and uh, I scrolled back and looked through, and I think this is our uh, 11th episode. We've done 10 episodes so far, um, you know, and uh, you can go check them out. There'll be a link in the show notes to uh, probably just a page where I'll list all of the ones that we've done together. Um, you know, so I'm going to skip the introductions, as we often usually do here. It's just like, who are you and what are you up to? And let's just go straight to like, what's going on? What's new? You know, last time we recorded, I believe, was, uh, was in the fall sometime. Um, what's going on? What's new in your world these days, folks? Mm, new kitty cat. Uh huh. And um, ants. We have ants. <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> I would like I would like to sound cooler than that. Those are the focuses of my days right now, but those are kind of the focuses of the day. <laughs> and and and. Do you talk to the ants? I mean, I'm assuming you talk to the cat, but I do talk to the cat. I do explain to the ants that it will go poorly for them if they continue their endeavors in my house. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is why I can't really be a Buddhist. <laughs> Fair enough. We all, we all have our limits, right? <laughs> totally. That's mine. Yeah. How about you, Fabeku? What's, what's shaking in your world? Uh, still one cat, no ants as of now, knock on wood. So that's a thing. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Life just feels super different than it did the last time we talked. It feels super different than a week ago at this point. So it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. Lots of stuff changing and shifting and dropping off and popping up and, you mm -hmm. know, most of it's, most of it's good, but you know life in this weird moment it's a thing so yeah yeah for sure yeah i've been uh number one ants yes 
there's a colony uh, it's in front of my place there's a, like patios that run across all the it's like a townhouse thing there's like a bunch of patio stones that run all the way across and the ants have erupted through the cracks in the patio stone so i'm like <laughs> you know gotta have a conversation with those those folks about uh getting gone you know because uh because yeah there's a lot of them so you know if it was just a few some years it's just a few it's like eh, you guys can hang out Exactly. But, uh, but there's so many of them and I'm like, nah, this is going to be, this is going to be a problem. It's only going to get worse as the year goes on. So we would actually probably be okay, except that we have the baby kitty who's on wet food, which is the combo is not possible. Right. Like, we yep. got to come inside for it. It's like, well, then I got to kill you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm feeling that like transformational vibe. You know, I feel like I'm not even sure that I can entirely articulate what's going on with things, but like, and maybe it's, and maybe it's a bit of a feeling like, you know, we're, we're scheduled to reopen here um, after being locked down since we'll have been, by the time we reopen, we'll have been pretty much closed almost entirely, except for like curbside pickup and deliveries and stuff across the city for like six months, you know? And, uh, but we're supposed to be reopening starting maybe mid June. And um, yeah, I feel like, I feel like, you know, all these questions, these memes that I saw kicking around, what do you want to, to not change back after things close, you know, and like, you know, what's changed because of COVID and so on. And I don't know about that. That stuff often feels way too simplistic to me, but, um, but I do think it's a point of reflection and, uh, reconsideration you know and to some extent even sort of checking back in with like pieces that i think of as being deeply core to my identity that just haven't had the capacity for expression for you know what will probably be like 18 months or two years maybe by the time this is fully fully done right so yeah yeah i definitely get a piece of that um in that I'm kind of, I've kind of gotten quieter and quieter during this. Hmm. It's been good. It's got me really looking at a lot of my, um, I would just say that there's a lot of stuff that I can ignore when I'm busy. Hmm. And so becoming way less busy has really brought a lot of that to the forefront. Um, And so that's been really my focus and still is, is like, okay, so it's funny, like I have like a book that wants to come out, but I'm also like, I don't know that I can do that book till I'm a little further along with what's going on right now. You know? mm. mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I noticed a similar thing for me with the quiet. I think that, um, I mean, outside of client stuff and teaching stuff, like I had a period and I think I'm on the tail end of it, maybe, I don't know. Um, it was almost like I just didn't have words. Like I would have conversations with people and I was unusually quiet and not, not that I was disinterested, but it's like the words weren't even there. Like, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to respond. When somebody asked me, what am I up to? I, I don't even, I don't know. Um, and it has translated to some of the writing stuff too, because, you know, I was working on some writing stuff, uh, book stuff. And uh, then a few months ago, like I would just sit and look, it's like, I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't, I don't, it was an odd thing. There's a, there's a, uh, and I don't dig it. I mean, I think it probably is a, for me, a sort of organic part of the process, but um, yeah, I don't dig it a ton, you know, just, and that's the thing, you know, cause I, I spent some time thinking, is this, you know, is this shifting in response to what's going on? Is it the fact that, you know, still I'm what 14, 15 months in still haven't left the house once in that period of time. Um, is it, being tired is a depression is it you know what is it i don't i don't know what it is and it probably is a mix of all of those things but um i've never experienced that before in 46 years ever it's never never have a, have i experienced it like this before it's really strange yeah i'm kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum which is my covid experience is every time we go into lockdown my regular work week, you know, which sort of cruises 
if I'm, if I'm lucky, 35 hours, 40 hours, you know, like something like that, like a kind of standard work week, but spread out, um, you know, between clients and running the shop and stuff like that. Um, you know, my work week just balloons up to like 60 hours because running a business that, that doesn't allow for walk-in traffic off the street is, you know, just exponentially more time consuming. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so much more correspondence. There's so much more social media. There's so much more everything. And so what I've had is, is not that I don't know what to say. I've got, I've got two decks finished Mm -hmm. that are ready to be published. And I just don't even have the attention to send one of them to the publisher because filling out the paperwork for that feels like just too much, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and it is too much because it's like, where am I going to, where am I going to find an extra, you know, four hours in my week? The answer is only from my already diminished sleep schedule, you know, (laughs) which is is not an option anymore. You know, it's like, I can't push that down below seven hours or I'm just not going to be able to show up. And, you know, and like being a, being a parent and having my kids with me half time, you know, and they're schooling from home and there's all of their uh, needs and feels and, and that kind of stuff where they would otherwise, you know, probably be a lot more teenagerly be like, Oh, Hey dad, I'm going to Chinatown with my kids to go look at the stuffed animals. Great. See you later. You know, text me if you go somewhere else, you know, um, instead we're, we're around and I'm managing, you know, working on their stress a lot and stuff like that. And so I have lots of things that are waiting to say and, and just no energy to say them, you know, just no, en- mm-hmm. or, or no time to encapsulate them and put them out there, you know? Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, I mean, I think I said this before. I was going to launch a Kickstarter for my uh, Bacon Wizard Breakfast Oracle that I made uh, back in end of March of last year, right? Like it was just all synced up, had it all ready and whatever. And then it just, I was like, oh, now, now we're locked down, you know? And then like, I was like, oh, I'll do it in October, you know? But then the kids didn't go back to school. And then I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll do it. I'm like... I'm not even going to kickstart it anymore. Maybe I'm just going to get a publisher, but even just that process, you know, mm-hmm. and yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious, especially as I become like more and more focused on what my time is about these days and what I, what I want or need my time to be about. Um, I'm like, well, what's going to be different on the other side of this? You know, what's when the kids do go back to school in September, hopefully, or, you know, once we open up and, I can, you know, have more staff doing stuff and less me doing stuff. Um, am I, am I going to have the attention for those things, you know, um, or, or has their, has their time passed, you know, I don't know. It's confusing. It's unclear and confusing to think about, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, it is a weird thing. I've, I've started two different books uh, and got the same way distance into them. Like, got like a quarter into both of them there. And it's like, nope, this is not the one that's happening right now. Um, so it is a strange, it's a strange moment overall, energetically, I think. Yeah. And it's also, it becomes more, I think the thing for me is I'm always trying to produce stuff that's helpful. And so like the, the last book was really easy. It synced up really well. Like this is going to be really helpful for the time that it was. Mm-hmm. So I kind of changed my schedule around it and got it out at the beginning of this more or less or in the middle of it but um yeah it's 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 interesting because i'm not really sure how to get out the stuff that i think is helpful right now Mm. um i have stuff that i'm interested that i think would be overall useful but it seems like we're in such a strong transition point that i would like to be able to get something that's more specifically Mm -hmm. um you know not just only relevant to now but uh, will kind of serve the community that reads my stuff now. Mm-hmm. So it's an interesting little conundrum there of like, what what are people actually dealing with, and do I know anything that's useful there? Right. Um, do I have anything to share that's useful there? And I'm not sure yet. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I went I went through a similar thing with that because I was kind of full steam ahead on this book on uh, sort of this weird uh, audio visual magic stuff, and I mean it's it's. Uh, one of the things I love the most and I got to a certain point in it. Uh, I don't know. So at some point last year and started to realize, yeah, I, this is interesting, but I don't 
it's not as functionally useful. I mean, it's not that there's not practical parts, but it was like, it was exactly what you're saying. It's like, oh no, this is not the thing that people need right now. This is, Mm -hmm. you know, let's revisit this in a year from now or two years from now and see where that is. But in terms of, because I I started thinking if, if people had this in their hand, does this help them navigate what they're dealing with day to day? And it was like, eh, not really, not, not in the way that, that feels important now. And so I just, that project is just kind of shelved for the time being, right. you know, at some point, hopefully I'll get back to it. Cause I'd love to, I'd love to share some stuff about it, but um, yeah, it, it, exactly that. It just didn't feel like this is the most meaningful, relevant needed thing right now. Yeah. I've been talking to a number of folks that are, are kind of also having that same experience and, um, you know, I self-publish and you work with Revelor. Um, and one of the things that, that is interesting seeing with the folks that are actually working with the bigger publishers is they're having this happen with projects that they're committed to on timelines. Uh, yeah. And they're really struggling with it. Yeah, and there are a couple sure. of folks that are having that issue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that, I think that for me anyway, other than like super specific one-on-one you know, I'm reading the cards for a person and we're talking about what they need right now. I think that it's become colossally ambiguous what what actually is, you know, like needed right now, you know, like what is that thing? I don't know, you know, like like I felt the I felt like a strong pull with working with the ancestors and, you know, did a bunch of ancestral healing for everybody and kind of calling on the ancestors who knew about surviving these times to work on stuff. But the, the the pull on that disappeared at a certain point, you know? They're like it's almost like, well, we've done what we can now, you know? And yeah, maybe that's not true. Maybe maybe it's something to be revisited, but um but it feels like like I don't really know what's gonna make a difference mm-hmm. anymore, you know? Like are you know, and, and certainly for me, I feel like all that's left is like, you know the last the last push to what i hope is the finish line you know and it's like you know when you're when you're riding a bike and you you're like 90 kilometers into a 100 kilometer ride and you're tired and whatever and you're like i just got to get to the end right and like maybe the last kilometer feels a little jubilant and whatever as the end is actually in sight but there's a push in there somewhere where it's like there's nothing to do but just move my feet and keep keep going currently mm-hmm. you know yeah. Well, and, you know, I think another uh, another part of that, because for me, that's how, uh, for all of us, I think that's how every day has felt like since this shit started, you know, just, just get to the end of the day and, mm-hmm. you know, do whatever needs to get done. And for me, at some point, I don't know, probably late last year, early this year, I started to look at, you know, what are the pieces that have unhelpful weight to them? What are the pieces that make that last mile hard and i've just started just chucking shit left and right it's like nope uh, fuck this and fuck that and fuck all of that and not investing any more time in this piece and uh i mean it it felt kind of essential at some point because it was like well if i don't do this am i going to make that last mile is that even going to happen you know um and it seems like a ton of people that i'm talking to are kind of doing the same thing you know and uh, it's a weird, it makes sense. And it's kind of a weird, unexpected part of this, you know, it's just like, no, I can't, this is not important or helpful enough to continue to carry this in my backpack when I'm just trying to get to whatever the finish line is, you know? So yeah, there's been a lot of stuff that's been sort of jettisoned at this point. Yeah, definitely. I definitely can, can feel that one. That's been a huge process and it's been interesting just to see like, if I let go of this, is it okay? Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, there's, it's that habitual hanging on to certain things um, and uh, seeing which things are okay and which things I do want to change, you know, like, okay, that needs to come back in, but mm. it needs to be different. Yeah. Because uh, again, there's only so much. Yeah, there's only so much I'm, I'm interested in doing and that I think is beneficial for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that allows me to be beneficial for my people. And if I'm kind of blowing that 
on uh, the excess baggagey stuff, mm-hmm. um, then I'm both less capable for myself and for helping other people uh, and supporting other people. Yeah, for me, it's been almost like, and I'm making this up because I don't bike or camp, but you know, like people that have those those nutrient dense, lightweight meals that they can take with them, so that you know they have the calories and the stuff that they need. I've been looking at a lot of that stuff, and you know, with magical practice and a lot of other things, it's like you know the amount of input that's required versus the output no longer makes sense. And the Mm -hmm. fact that I find it interesting at this point, I don't give a shit. It doesn't, interesting is not enough to, you know, to keep it in the pack for me. It's, you know, what's the most effective, efficient, nutrient dense thing that I can, I can travel with that uh, actually makes sense. You know, the input and the output line up in ways that feel coherent for me at this point. Mm -hmm. There's a great moment. There's a movie called uh, Into the Wild. Mm -hmm. That's what it's called. Mm-hmm. Uh, but about hiking the Pacific Coast Trail, and uh, is that the right name? I don't know. Maybe I have the wrong name for it. Anyway, Into the Wild is the Christopher McCandless story. Oh no, not that one then. Um, anyway, there's a movie. I'll I'll put it in the show notes about um, about hiking the Pacific Trail and the the person who did it. You know, there there's a scene where they're running into somebody who uh, really knows what they're doing, and they're like, "All right, unpack your backpack. Let's go through it." Right? And they're like, "You don't need this." You don't need that. Why do you need two of these? Why do you need whatever, right? And I think in some ways for me, you know, the that stuff is, uh, you know, not that I've let my sort of Orisha priest stuff slide per se, although to be honest, I mean, it's kind of impossible to do much of anything during yeah. COVID here in Canada. You know, I mean, in the States, people are doing more things. Rules are different, but up here, it's like, you know, we're not supposed to hang out with anybody, so you know, and everything's closed. So there's no options. Right. And, um, but I, but I feel like sort of, there's been a reorientation towards that and, a, you know, not that I forgot that that's my primary thing, but, uh, but sort of a commitment and a readiness to kind of step into that in a new level, you know? And uh, yeah. So, you know, for th- me, it, it, it's been the exact same thing. It's been the exact same thing. Cause I think, Again, it's not that I let that stuff go, but a lot of it kind of just slid into the background and it it started to be, uh, I was thinking about it. It's almost like there's a piece of art that you really love and it's on the wall so long that you just kind of stop noticing it. Mm -hmm. And occasionally you'll, you know, catch a glimpse and wow, I really dig that painting. But a lot of times you just pass by it. And for me, it had, it had kind of become that sort of thing for a Mm -hmm. while. And you know, after between the pandemic stuff and all the crazy health stuff last year and all of it, at some point I was like, wait a minute, this is, this is the foundation for me. This is the foundation of everything. So Mm -hmm. why, you know, why, why am I not paying more attention to this painting? And, you know, when I do going back to the nutrient dense stuff, look at what happens and look at how quickly it happens and look at relatively how easy it happens. And then, yeah, that's been a big part of, kind of reevaluating what's in that pack, you know? And it's like, oh, yeah, no, this, this should be uh, a more front and center kind of note in the, uh, in the, in the equation, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. it's tough, right, with that stuff because it's such a um, community practice, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I know, I know you, you, you've sort of don't have a local community and same for me, right? Like, I mean, I have God kids, but you know, the community here in Toronto is very splintered and not very cohesive and, you know, very like lots of politics and whatever. Right. So it's pretty complicated. And my actual elders are, are in Miami. Right. And it's like, you know, number one, can't go there at all right now, you know? But number two, it's very different than if I were to be living where those people were and to be able to sort of have that regular community thing. But here it's like, what's what's the thing that's happening? Nothing. Yeah. Or, or a thing that I make up to make happen, which feels like a waste of time, you know? Well, I mean, that, that is an interesting thing because a, a few weeks ago, I, I finished some kind of big ceremonies for the Orisha stuff. And uh, it took me three months just to figure out how to make it happen. And it was just me. I mean, it was just me in the house doing this stuff, which is 
you know, obviously suboptimal and, you know, the stuff needed to happen, but just even, even the logistics of stuff, trying to get what I needed and to make it happen, it, it mm-hmm. felt like some mission impossible movie. I mean, it, was, right. it, was, it was wild. Yeah. Know? Um, yeah. And, and doing the ceremonies and things by myself in the house was like, yeah, this is a really surreal way. And again, needed to be done, but, um, yeah. And so I, I think that's the other piece I have been thinking about more again, that, that kind of communal aspect of it, which to me just obviously feels kind of heightened with all the isolation stuff that's going on right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's complicated. Right. Mm-hmm. And it does highlight for me, like, you know, how, how the rest of the, st- like, cause I have, I have like two practices, right. I have my religious practice, which is only for people who are engaged in that. Right. You know, and then I have my uh, practice of what I do with clients, right? Which is, you know, spirit driven, but not Orisha stuff, right? Because from my point of view, if you're not, if you're not in the Orisha tradition or in a Orisha tradition, then I'm just like, then I'm not going to do anything along that line. You know, that's uh, it's, it comes with, from my point of view, obligation and the need for uh, an openness to long-term relationships and, and other things that lots of people aren't looking for when they're looking for magic, right? They're just like, I need, I need your help getting this job. I need you to make this court case go away. I need you to whatever. Right. And, and that's fine, but I'm just never going to take that to the Orishas, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that what happens is because the, the client facing stuff is so active and ongoing it it takes over the space you know what i mean and it's not that it's not that i i even engage much of that for myself because i don't really uh mostly i just work arisha stuff but um but yeah it just sort of consumes the attention you mm-hmm. know and it reminds me a bit of the conversation i had and sort of why i moved away from paying attention to astrology as well you know like i talked about this with jen zartan in episode I don't know when, maybe last year. Look it up if you want to hear hear my longer reasons for moving away from astrology. But the short note is I found that it was taking up my attention in a way that was diverting me from the core practice that is the actual relevant core practice for me, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, folks, I just want to jump in here for a second and remind people that the hermit's lamp is also a store so i have an online store and an in-person store in toronto that sells over 400 tarot decks 300 kinds of crystals and incense incense holders candles oils and all the magical goodies you might want for whatever spiritual practice you were up to i think we have great prices on stuff Everything is sourced to the best of my ability to be authentic. And we offer uh, pickup or in-store shopping when it's not COVID in Toronto. And we offer delivery just about anywhere in the world. So do me a favor. Next time you're thinking about stuff, drop by the hermitslamp.com. Check it out. See if we've got something you need there. Because I always appreciate that support. It's, that makes sense. I mean, I, I did this process that I started a couple of years ago, but I actually completed it. Oh, I don't know. Maybe three months ago, but um, I have one. I have one piece of magical kind of stuff, um, which is just a pendant that I have from the late 80s, but I got rid of everything else materialized statues icons my skulls all of that stuff is gone i have no uh i have nothing i have no material basically i have no kind of support stuff um and it's it was very good to do that because it cleared so much of the air is what i would say but it also dropped me back into a really interesting thing which is for me my shift has been like, okay, the things that I know work for me are kind of rooted in Buddhist psychology. And that's where I've kind of switched my focus is like, okay, let's go back 
and separate from where I've kind of looked at that stuff before. Let's start again. And um, let's, uh, let's begin the meditation practice there again. And let's just actually run that as it's more or less designed, right? <laughs> Rather than me messing with it as much as I have in the past. Um, and so that's a very, it's been a very, uh, like everything on my end gets quieter and quieter. It's uh, even just thinking about those kind of basic precepts of like, okay, I know that the things that I can control are my thoughts, words, and deeds, right? Um, do I want to say what I'm typing right now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, is there a benefit there? Is that uh, skillfully used, <laughs> right? Um, well, and I know you've also stepped back from being on social media as much and, you know, mm -hmm. like all of those kinds of things too, right? So like, yeah. it sounds like, uh, you know, you're, you're, you've slid more into a sort of hermit kind of energy than, uh, yeah. than, you know, whatever we would call what you were at before. Definitely. Yeah, that was a big shift that like kind of became possible after I stopped making the jewelry. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so it's, uh, I do keep it, keep an eye on the, the six ways group and all of that, but um, I'm ever more offline, I would say, mm -hmm. continuously pushing that. It's like, okay, how, how, how little do I have to be online Mm -hmm. um, to do what I need to do there. Uh, and uh, being that it's, you know, just me and my wife and the cat at this point here, uh, there's not a lot to do other than that. So it opens up that space to just kind of go, okay, what's going on in my head? What's going on in my heart? Um, am I cool with those things? Uh, do they need attention? What parts of those things need attention? Um, and uh, yeah, trying to find a way that's way less overt, which is you know, really throwing me back to kind of pre-2011 when I kind of rejoined the magical community. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, I think it, that sort of attention on what's going on inside is so important, you know? I, um, a few people had sort of recommended um, somatic work you know and uh i had this sort of really interesting so one i started working with a local practitioner that a friend of mine knew and uh and that's been very interesting and very very beneficial and two i was noticing that i was having these huge bodily reactions to what was going on right oh my god we're going to be locked down again and my whole like body would just be like ah fuck right <laughs> And, um, and I was talking about it and peer counseling about it and like getting support and whatever, but like, there's this other level of reaction, right. That was happening. And I, please don't take any of this as testimonial or recommendations that you should go do herbal things. Please contact your doctor and blah, blah, blah. Full disclaimers here. Right. Okay. Folks, um, do your research. I am not a medical professional. Um, but I, I, a friend of mine was talking about ashwagandha and, um, and was talking about, because we were talking about trying to fix my janky sleep, right? And my sleep was super janky for a lot of this time. And so at their recommendation, I picked up a product that had a bunch of different stuff in it. And, you know, the idea with this is sort of you take it for a month and then you stop, right? Like it's, or whatever, consult your health, health professional. But like, it's definitely a thing where you, you don't, it's not like taking vitamin C, which maybe you want to do forever. Right. Um, it's something else. And I, and so I did this cycle of this and what I noticed in conjunction with, you know, cause I also started the somatic work during this time is what I noticed is that my bodily reactions to stuff were completely different. So instead of getting all jazzed up and freaked out and like, I can't sleep and I can't sit still. And I'm just like, ah, so much stress. I've got to do something about these things that I can't do anything about. I've just got to look at them and wait and see what happens. And, and I noticed that it just leveled all of that right out. Um, didn't really fix the sleep, although the sleep got better when I stopped, which may be related or maybe not hard to say, um, you know, and now I'm probably, I don't know, six to eight weeks on the other side of that. And even though like 
all sorts of super stressful stuff is going on right now. Um, the stress of it is completely different and the bodily reaction to it is quite different. And so I think that that learning ways and revisiting ways of sitting with the body and sitting with what's going on and so on, it's just super helpful. Right. And I think that for a lot of people, um, I think there's this point at which we can keep talking about stuff, but so what, you know, like, you know, we can talk about it endlessly and, you know, not for everybody, like people do need to digest things and so on. But, but there comes a point that's like, okay, well, what next? How do we move forward with this? Right. And, you know, I'm pretty damn clear about all my issues, my baggage, my history and all those kinds of pieces. And there isn't a lot of value that comes from continuously revisiting that territory anymore, you know? And so it was very interesting to kind of have such a, a profound experience in a completely different, you know, approach. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, for me, uh, that all makes a ton of sense. I think it was in early January. I reached out and did some online therapy stuff for a second because, uh, again, I was having really kind of intense stress response, body reaction stuff. And every day I just felt like I am about to snap, like I am going to snap into if this shit keeps up. And uh, for me, the kind of conventional therapy thing was not super helpful because again, talking about it was not what I needed. And at one point when I was talking to the therapist, I said, listen, this is a body thing I'm talking about. This is not a cognitive thing. And I'm like, Oh wait, shit, I'm doing the wrong thing. And so uh, that's when I jumped into some somatic stuff, which helped a ton. And the other big piece for me is it was all of this kind of pending ritual work stuff, the Orisha stuff that needed to to be done because I woke up the next morning after that and felt 80% better. And at first I thought, Oh, well, listen, I'm just relieved that I got it done because it took forever to coordinate and it was just a lot to do. And it must be that. But since then I've, I've consistently felt way better, way, way better. And it was immediate. I mean, it was, you know, I feel like the, the somatic stuff kind of knocked it down a couple of notches so that I didn't completely fracture into pieces. But, uh, you know, that, that ceremony piece, it was, it was instantaneous for me. Well, I think, I mean, you know, the thing that, thing that for me that makes total sense about that, right. Because definitely I had, you know, had a reading with my elder that sort of set, set a different tone for me as well around a lot of stuff. Right. And, you know, I think that one of the things that that is deeply true of my experience and maybe yours too, right, is when, when you're a priest in these traditions, the Orishas are not external things, right? Yeah. They, they truly live within you, right, in a way that non-initiates, you know, from my understanding, it just isn't that case, right? And so when when I got my reading and... You know, it came came blessings at the foot of Shango, right? Who's the crown, right? My crown. And Shango's exuberance and happiness and, and joyfulness about the things that we were talking about and their optimism about things that were coming my way were palpable, you know? Mm-hmm. And I literally found myself kind of dancing around and like singing to them and feeling that energy and just being like, consumed by that in a way that um you know one i'm not sure how often i've actually had that direct and experience of it before right mm-hmm. some of that i think comes from uh you know next this summer i'll have like 13 years of ocha right so mm-hmm. it settles in right they settle mm-hmm. in over time um and part of it's just you know maybe situational too right but um but you know it's like I've had I've had that experience during ritual. I've had that experience, uh, you know, in my ceremonial days. I had experience of that when I was like, you know, would call up whatever and you know and have a, like a a full direct experience of it and whatever. But it never endured in the way in which this is endured, right? And I think that there's that fundamental difference about this particular set of traditions and how that stuff works. And what happens through initiation mm. that that can't be replicated elsewhere, you know, and doesn't really have a place 
at least in my understanding and my experiences, it's it's not present in ceremonial work and other kinds of stuff because it's just a fundamentally different approach and set of ideas and, you know, technology, if you prefer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting. I had a chat with a young woman who's um, involved in um, 21 divisions, mm -hmm. kind of Dominican side of the voodoo thing. And it was interesting talking to her um, because it kind of reflected so much of what you guys are talking about, that there is this um, level of presence there that uh, I think is, is, as you said, kind of lacking in a lot of the more Western ceremonial approaches and things like that. Um, and it was interesting because it's like, though I've had, I've had touches of that, that sense of things. It was just really beautiful talking to her um, because it was so palpable on her. It was like, a, it was a good reminder. Like, mm. yeah, this is, there, there's, there's so many different levels to all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's a, a sense that they are more meshed in a way than they are, right? There's that, um, there's the, you know, old saying that was really, I think, only really talking about the Abrahamic religions when it was created, but they were saying that, you know, all, all kind of religious practices lead to the same thing. And I really don't find that to be true. Mm -hmm. um, and I definitely don't find it about magical practices either. But um, so it's interesting hearing you guys talk about that because I just talked to her a couple of days ago and that was the thing that kind of came off of it to me was like, no, her, her experience of what's going on is very different than, than mine and most of the folks that I've talked to in depth that are outside of those traditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that, that that expression, you know, and that idea that everything runs to the same place, right? Like, I mean, I think that that's just ultimately, you know, colonial bunk right you know yeah and like you know as somebody was somebody reached a uh, somebody was writing a writing an article i don't know somebody some some journalist reached out to me to ask me to fact check some stuff that they were doing right and they were like you know one of the things was like um tarot tarot is the story of the hero's journey and i'm like well no you know possibly right like Sure, that can be a thing, but also you should look at the hero's journey and understand that that is a colonialist idea that lots of people like, and there are interesting pieces to it. The idea of the hero's journey, but the idea of the hero's journey is universal is not true. It's fundamentally just, you know, uh, a, a colonialist overlay of we're going to, we're going to make everything one instead of actually recognizing things for what they are. Right. And, mm. you know, I think it's, yeah, it's really problematic, you know, and I think that there are lots of ways in which we see that stuff in, um, I see that stuff all the time on many levels all over the place, you know, in witchy stuff, in new age stuff, in crystal communities and whatever. And it's like, why, why, why do we feel like we need to have a singular true story Mm -hmm. that unify, unites across all human experience instead of just saying like, let's just be really present and see what's actually going on here. Mm -hmm. And then if there is some semblance of universality, it's probably, it's probably not that there's a singular story, but that there are related things that one deals with that are not the same, right? Like Ori in Orisha stuff, the, the Orisha of destiny or the sense of your destiny or your own personal Orisha is not the same as your holy guardian angel. Mm -hmm. If you're doing, you know, ceremonial stuff, are they similar? Is that experience relatable? You know, might there be, might there be overlap in some way? Possibly, but it's not singular. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I agreed. And I think that it's a thing that I've seen a lot. And it's a thing I, I did. And I think in the beginning, when I was plugging into the Orisha stuff in the whatever 90s, late 90s, you know, I, you see people say, oh, well, you know, uh, Oshun is the, the Yoruba Venus. Well, she's not. That's not that's not real. Um, you know, are there are there qualities on some level that she shares? Sure. And there's a ton of ways that she's super different. 
And I think what happens, again, there's the colonial stuff that is uh, entirely sideways. And when people land on those ideas, then suddenly they miss all of the things that aren't true from that perspective. If you say Oshun is Venus and you have a sense of Venus and then suddenly you just swap them out as being synonymous, then there's entire aspects of Oshun or any of the Orisha or any spirit period that you just miss and you don't understand and you, you, uh, it becomes invisible because we've come up with this idea that, oh, you know, Venus is Oshun is, is Aphrodite is whoever. And it's like, come on, really? Like I get it again. I mean, that, I think that's a thing that, that I kind of drug into my sort of early participation with Orisha stuff. And I had to realize, oh no, this isn't real. What I'm saying, this is not, this is not true. I think it, it felt like a kind of a convenient way for me to have some illusion of understanding but I wasn't understanding it. It was the opposite. I was, I was misunderstanding what was actually happening. And, you know, for me, there was a, a lot of just kind of just checking that stuff and, and dropping it because it, it wasn't true and it wasn't helpful at all. Yeah, I see that. And even, even, I mean, the place that I probably see it the most is kind of, um, and again, I'm not, a, I don't consider myself even a Buddhist, though I find it incredibly useful. Um, I see a lot of that in the kind of magical and Western takes on Buddhism mm. um, that you can, it's not this thing that you think it is. You're not looking at the nuances here and you're not separating out the kind of um, language issues. Like mm -hmm. all of us that come from kind of Judeo Christian backgrounds have a very different concept of suffering. Mm -hmm. um, then I think what is present in, uh, in in Buddhism overall. And so if we don't kind of look at that and go, what are they really talking about here? If we kind of take it on a surface level or kind of misapprehensions of karma, um, because again, we're kind of coming from a particular base view, even if it's not one that we kind of hold close to our heart, it's still what we were raised in. Um, and it's very fascinating to see that among people who are generally extremely re well read mm. um, in the kind of magical and pagan world. I, I, I tend to find that, that this is a group that reads extensively, um, but that there's a lot of that nuance aspects that get lost. Um, and even one of the things that I realized after talking to that woman the other day that was involved in the 21 divisions that I learned from somebody whose background was in Lukumi actually. Mm -hmm. um, woman that I knew when I was in my early 20s. And what she said is that her perception, she was involved in lots of stuff, but her perception was that um, there are classes of beings that kind of operate in similar zones, right? Um, and this is where I think I came up with that idea that if we look at the whole thing, the whole field, the whole universe, then yeah, there's like, sure, you have things that are related to crossroads and road opening and gatekeeping and locks and all of that stuff. But to think that they're all the same is just mm -hmm. bizarre. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it's like thinking that all of the cells in your body that are, you know, related to your immune system are the same. Uh, why would that be? It doesn't mm -hmm. even make sense, right? Um, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, and the the language piece is, is a good point too, because you know, I've been thinking about this a lot as I've been reading some of the, the sort of divinatory text from uh, Ifa practice. And, you know, I mean, even, uh, I mean, just the Yoruba language in itself, but even when things are translated accurately, it's like, there's a, there's a, how to say this, the, the word means something different in that cultural context than it means to somebody outside of that cultural context. And, I think that's that's a thing that's easy to get lost, right? So, you know, when the Buddhists are talking about karma or suffering, like you said, and I've got an image of suffering, I read suffering and think, oh, okay, that means this. So the Buddhists are saying this about suffering. But are they really? Are they really saying that about suffering? Or is my under... It's almost like instead of the actual transmission, we're embracing an echo of an echo of an echo kind of a thing. And naturally, over time, the clarity and the strength of that starts to fall apart. But then, then 
if we don't get that, then we start to kind of cohere around this idea of, oh, well, in Buddhism, suffering means this. And then, you know, we're just kind of off in some weird sideways direction, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and that's the thing that I've realized as somebody that was not born in, in Yoruba culture, there's words and ideas I'm never going to understand ever that, that are part of that tradition. I mean, I can, I can ask people from that culture. I can work to kind of unpack my own echoey bullshit around it, but there's some stuff that I'm just never going to have that understanding of because I just come from a different background, different perception, you know? And I think that, I think that knowing that, feels pretty important whether you're reading buddhist stuff or yoruba stuff or anything Mm -hmm. absolutely well i think you know there's a an expression which i love which is uh 10 minutes with a wise person is uh worth more than reading 100 books Mm. you know and i think there's something about that direct actual transmission right that communication that comes and especially where it's particular to you as opposed to like just listening, like I'm not talking about like listening to somebody, you know, somebody's Ted talk or YouTube video or whatever. I'm talking about actually having a, like a, you know, a wise person or an elder or a a monk or whatever, put their attention on you for that period of time. And, you know, I think that we could uh, further embellish that and say, you know, it's it's worth more than a hundred books. It's worth more than uh a thousand TikToks, it's worth more than, you know, whatever, right? Because the the amount of other stuff that it takes to hit that point where it can disrupt that notion that we have of like, oh yeah, yeah, this is this. And they're like, well, not really actually. It's more like this and this and this. It's like, oh, cool. But it's super hard to sorry for the ruckus. Uh super hard to to hit that in other means right it's one of the reasons why why i'm not interested in doing short form podcasts right Mm -hmm. i think that the conversations and the podcasts take time to develop and i think that if we were to you know be like i might i might be more popular and have more listeners if i did a 20 minute podcast because people could just consume them and consume them and consume them and and that's fine for what it is but i'm like I want to get to the core of things, you know, I want to really dig in and uh, waiting for the truck to pass. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but uh, <laughs> the window is open. It's hot here in Toronto today and uh, there's a busy street. Uh, but yeah, just making space for that. I think it's just so, so important, you know, and I think that, you know, kind of like Aiden, you're doing where you're slowing down and listening to your body, your mind, your heart, your spirit and all those things. I think that in some ways that's, that's what I think that we need more of in the spirit world, in in the spiritual communities in general, you know, and it's kind of contrary to the way in which social media is going to some extent and so on, or parts of social media. Um, But I just, I think that it's what's important, you know, I think it's what actually makes a difference to people's lives, you know? Well, to me, one of the pieces that's missing in the the Instagram post or the book or the TikTok or whatever is the is the conversation, and I think that's the piece with the elder, the teacher, the you know whoever it is that becomes super important because you know you can. I think that's where you you get like you said that kind of individualized, specific to you dialogue that you know if i'm talking to a buddhist teacher and i say oh well suffering means this and they say well not really and then we can have a back and forth and i think in that back and forth that's where things kind of unknot themselves and that's where things start to settle in and you start to to have a more felt sense of it instead of this weird uh, exclusively cognitive oh this is a chunk of information that i picked up on instagram or in a book or on youtube or whatever and all of that's fine But I think that if it's not balanced and probably founded on some kind of actual living conversation with somebody that's immersed in whatever it is you're learning, whether it's Buddhist stuff or Ifa practice or sigil magic or whatever it is, I don't know. It, it, I think it, I think it turns into something different uh, when that's somebody's experience, when that, that conversation is missing. Yeah, I think, in uh, in the episode with uh, Jason Miller that came out as part of this uh, spring season of episodes, we talked about um, personal gnosis, right? Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that, I think that, you know, it, it might be worth considering and I hadn't really thought about it this way until this conversation, but it might be worth considering that anything that isn't attached to tradition is probably just personal gnosis, right? And that might be really great. It might be useful and like go listen to the episode with Jason Miller. We talked about like finding validation and what we might do and when we might share those things and, and all kinds of stuff. And it's not that, you know, like Aiden's work, right? Which is you know, comes from a personal experience and, and, and through the books and so on and has a really great and powerful, uh, you know, kind of application to people who are drawn to working in those ways. It's great. Um, but I think that a lot of people think because they can uh, read some books, you know, and I, and I thought this too, right? You know, like my, my work with Enochian Magic, right? I, I would reg- register it as personal gnosis now you know i didn't at the time right i thought i was tra- tapping into the true universal whatever and and in some ways i think that i did you know and in some ways i talked to people on and experience shared experiences around those and so on which point to that deeper level but i think that there's a lot of stuff where people um and myself historically too at times um mistake that personal experience for being you know, universal and sort of inherently true. And, and I think that things that are more replicable, things that are tied to tradition and so on are, are much more likely to be universally true or universally applicable versus these personal experiences, which, you know, we've really, we really need to sort of scrutinize on some level. And I think that we, benefit from scrutinizing that before we share them and put them out there and stuff like that. Mm. Um, you know, I think that's part of what we're maybe not seeing as much of that. I would like to see more of is that kind of reflection and, and understanding, you know? Yeah. 100%. And I think it's interesting. I mean, it's, I definitely, I was talking to somebody, I don't remember who um, recently that that was part of what, uh, what really informs particularly six ways, but um, for me, it was this realization that the vast majority of folks that I knew who were struggling were the folks that weren't drawn to a tradition, Mm -hmm. Um, which makes sense to me because I had that same experience. Um, And so it is, you know, I'll get periodic people sending me hate mail because they think I'm anti-tradition. It's like, no, I'm just not in one. (laughs) Um, Mm. And so I'm speaking to the folks that are also not in one. Yeah, uh, it's not that I don't think that that's incredibly potent and powerful, mm-hmm. um, and not to, and obviously, and I hope it doesn't come across this way to folks who are listening because I know Aiden and I know each other, so this yeah, like totally. it's a non-issue between us. <laughs> but for folks listening, I'm not saying you need to be in a tradition mm. to 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 do stuff. I'm just saying that in the absence of tradition, the the onus to sort of be more conscious of what you're doing and how you're thinking about it. And to sort of maybe test or look for proof or whatever is probably a lot higher. Maybe it's absolutely, it. absolutely, and that's kind of what led me out of kind of group group practice. You know, most of my group practice was either around OTO, some witchcraft groups, and um, then chaos magic groups. And that's really what led left me out of that. Was like we so don't even have a same base level language that trying to do this kind of intense group work on levels that I was interested in just didn't make sense to me anymore. It's like, no, I'm better off taking this home where I can really kind of interrogate what's going on and uh, then seek out people, you know, uh, that I know that I can bounce stuff off of if things get wonky or if I'm not sure what's up, who knew me well enough to be able to read me. So these were folks that I would, you know, nowadays we would probably say are pro- were fairly clairvoyant um, practitioners. Um, there were two of them in my life who I could kind of go in and go, things are weird. And they could read me enough to not even need to necessarily know what specifically I had done, but go, yeah, you've got some stuff that's a little janky here. <laughs> and we can, you know, these are the places to go look. It, it allowed me to sort it out. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the tradition aspects um really reading again the buddhist stuff because looking at the folks that uh from the west who connected to uh you know teachers in the east 
in the 60s, 70s, whatever kind of first wave in Nepal, Tibet kind of stuff, um, post Tibet, I guess, Kathmandu. Um, and what their experience was, if you look at, if they ever talk about it, where you go, no, these folks like moved into the, sh into the hut and hung out for seven years without TV or radio or running water or bathrooms or any of that stuff mm -hmm. and got to be fully kind of immersed. And that's really the last crew that got that version. That version wasn't as available on that tight of a level. You know, I was reading from th something from Loma Surya Das who I think when he found his first kind of teacher, uh, I think he, he says that it was like less than five or six people there for the first several years hmm. from the West. So they really got that immersion into getting stuff sorted, you know? Hmm. Uh, and I think that that's the hard thing if you're working on your own entirely, or if you're working with other um, groups that don't have kind of deep history is that you really have to figure out how to sort yourself constantly. Because uh, we do tend to make up stories. It's what the brain does, right? The, it's what the mind does. It goes, oh, this means this then. Uh, and uh, understanding that that's not necessarily going to be accurate. <laughs> um, and keeping that at the forefront, to me, is the really big part of being kind of a solo or small group practitioner for something that doesn't have that kind of history. And, that kind of support system built into it. You know, one of the ways that I've started to, to look at the differences between, because for me, I went from chaos magic to EFA practice. I mean, it was kind of the, you know, the extreme ends of things. And I think that when, I think that when you're a part of a tradition, you have the benefit of, uh, almost like so the, there's two people that are trying to navigate through the forest and on the traditional end of things there's a path that's been created that enough people have traveled that you know it will get you from one end of the forest to another and i think for the people that aren't you know it's a, like they have to sort of break out their machete and and carve their own path and i don't think that i don't think one is necessarily better than the other I, they're just different and I think that it's kind of, I think there's people that dig taking machetes and hacking their way through the forest, which is awesome if that's your thing. And there's other people that, that find, oh no, this path is here. Let me just kind of walk it. And I think what the mistake that I made in my own relationship to tradition is at some point I started to equate an established path with a lack of freedom. Mm -hmm. And I started talking about well, the reason I kind of diverged from some of this stuff and kind of held some of this stuff a little more loosely than I had before was because I somehow thought that it meant I didn't have the freedom. I can hack my way through the forest anytime I want. There's nothing stopping me from doing that. And there's another option. There's another path that's available if that's not interesting to me. And, you know, for me, that was, that was an important realization because I think I had a really... Uh, at some point, I just got kind of sideways within myself about what what uh, tradition means and what it doesn't mean. And again, kind of going back to the idea of language, I think I I just had some weird distortion around that. That um, I think I, I held I held for longer than was helpful or that made sense or was really true. I think it's I think it's very difficult for a lot of people to. Um... I mean, as some people in the tradition would say, submit to the Orishas, right? To to put aside the sort of tension, you know, and, and sort of thing, because it's like, and I don't think of it so much as a lack of freedom, but as, you know, for me, it's a path that's deeply aligned with who I am, right? Mm. And so... Like I might have ideas about who I am that aren't true, right? Or aren't in alignment with that. But for me, I'm like, why, why wrestle with that? You know, like, you know, why hold on to my, my baggage, my issues, my personal things in the face of advice and possibilities that are more deeply true about who I am. Right. You know, and I think that the path of, of going down, 
the Orisha road for me has been one of, um, and which is part of its core belief, right? Like this alignment with who you are, this alignment with your Ori and your destiny, right? And for me, it's like I have freedom to do all sorts of stuff, you know? And I've, you know, in many ways, I have like, you know, I mean, kind of like all three of us in some ways, three of us collectively, I think, have more freedom than many people even have access to, you know, by virtue of being self-employed in certain ways, by virtue of other opportunities and so on, right? Like the capacity to do many things is, is probably closer in reach for us than it is for many people. But for me, I'm just like, life's going to have obstacles either way right? You know, things are going to come up, a pandemic happens, this happens, that happens, other things happen. And I'm like, I'd rather just save my energy for wrestling with those challenges. And, you know, and I, and I guess it's ultimately a matter of faith, but my faith is that, you know, the Orishas keep me on that easier path. And it leaves not having to navigate all those theoretical possibilities, leaves me that energy to show up more fully, to, you know, to deal with the things that come up along the way and all those kinds of things. And so for me, it actually feels like liberation, maybe is a good word for it, um, or freedom, if you know, but but the focus of it is so different. But I think it's so easy, especially for, for Western folks, and especially for people coming out of magic where, you know, the, the ego and the will can be very central to a lot of conversations. And I don't mean that as a criticism per se although i think there are lots of ways in which we need to be suspect around those things um the idea that they can do it independently they can do this they can do that and so on you know it needs to be put aside and it's not easy for people you know well i agree completely and i you know at one point when i was kind of working my way through this stuff i realized you know i mean in theory i have the freedom to drive down the wrong lane on the highway if i want to but you know, at some point, is that is that smart? Is it helpful? Is is it going to end well? Um, and you know, maybe when I was twenty, I was more hip to that idea. But at forty six, that's a little less interesting to me. And uh, instead, I, I kind of value also knowing that you know I can just take the road from point A to point B, and I know I'm going to get to point B without you know a, a weird head on collision or something sideways happening. Um, the ensuing police chase. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I had a, I had a lot of weird stuff around that that I realized was just all my own shit that really had nothing to do with what was actually going on in the uh, in the the tradition or or a coherent relationship to it. You know, it was just like, oh, you know, this is this is not real shit that I've kind of foisted on this this idea of tradition. So, yeah, I, I know for me, it's like. I think that all of that stuff came out because of very bad experiences as a young person around, uh, you know, the religions that were practiced around me, which was all Christian. Um, and it took me a long time to drop that stuff and realize that even where there was incredibly bad behavior, that was the people Mm -hmm. that were involved. It wasn't the nature of the religion. It's kind of like, you know, in the United States, there's a big issue with people believing that, Islam is all specifically, you know, mm-hmm. terror, which is clearly not true. If you've ever hung out with anybody who's Muslim, right? You can know. Um, and it's the same as, uh, as anything else. And for me, it was, I think, um, I think I took on the idea that guidance and being controlled were the same things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I always wanted a good guide, but I was really afraid of being controlled. Um, And I think that's probably what sends me back to Buddhism over and over again, is I can hear that voice for whatever reason very clearly as guidance. Like we know how this works. (laughs) Um, And if you would like to have some help with running this program that gets you from point A to point B, like you were saying, we can do that. Um, and it's interesting that that's one of the few places where I have no desire to try and make up my own path. It's like, I see it. It makes sense. I understand it, uh, to the degree that I understand it. And, uh, it's very easy for me to kind of, uh, 
you know, hook my cart up to that horse and go, okay, the horse knows where it's going. I don't have to try and figure this out. I just have to, you know, feed the horse and we'll be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that's a good place to end it. Find, find your path, feed your horse, folks. <laughs> yeah, find a good horse. <laughs> find a good horse, hang out with it. Yeah. Take good care of it. It'll take good care of you. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So for folks who are um, listening, who want to hang out, you know, in your spheres, where, where is a good place for people to come, come hang out with you? Aiden, where should people check in if they want to partake of your wonderful offerings and things? Um, AidenWalker.com has links to, out to everything else, but I'm on Instagram, lightly, Facebook, lightly, except that there's a six ways group that uh, is kind of folks dealing with my work that I try and um, chime in when I have something useful is useful to say, but it's mostly really for the folks that are doing the work. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I'm on Twitter also pretty lightly, um, but everything can be found through my website at AidenWalker.com. Nice. And yeah, if you are on Facebook and you're working through Aiden's books, I would really recommend spending some time in the group uh, mentioned six ways. Uh, it's a great space and uh, it's really well run. So it's definitely a, a good spot to hang out if you're, if you're engaged in that stuff. So, yeah. How about you for Baku? Uh, for Baku.com. I'm on Facebook and I'm, uh, as Aiden said, very lightly on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Very lightly. So I'm all in on Instagram. I love Instagram. If folks, <laughs> if folks want to actually like engage with me through social media, get on my Instagram. It's the, it's just, I'm at the hermit's lamp on I'm at the hermit's lamp everywhere. Um, but yeah, you know, Facebook and whatever I'm, I'm on all those places, but, but less so, but Instagram is my true love. Uh, I think that, yeah, that conjunction of imagery and words is, is just so ideal for me. Uh, although we'll see if the extending in, introduction of video ruins it forever we'll, we'll see um and of course you can uh check me out at the uh for my store uh you know where i've got all the magical goodies you might want and ship them everywhere so if you're listening we can hook you up with all sorts of great stuff uh and for all the other stuff i do it's there too all right thanks for listening everybody thank you for uh making time to chat with me today folks i appreciate getting the band back together as always Good. Thanks for having me. Always. Total pleasure. Thank you, as always, for listening, my friends. Uh, I want to just take a moment here and say, please do what you can to support the podcast. All right. I mentioned in the beginning about the uh, various ways in which you can provide some financial support, but I understand that this is also tough times for lots of folks and, you know, I, I get it. My store has been closed to the public for uh, the most of this year, which is kind of hard to, hard to understand and wrangle with. So uh, the other things that you can do to support this are rate us in your uh, podcast location, share it with other people, you know, on your socials or just tell people about it. Uh, you know, it's very hard these days to uh, make inroads on social media without paying for advertising. So that word of mouth stuff is really great for the ongoing success of the podcast. And of course, if there's anybody you'd like to see on the podcast, well, listen to on the podcast, um, drop me a line and let me know. Okay. But please do keep in mind that I never accept self-referrals. So I'm sure you're wonderful. I'm sure you're doing great stuff, but uh, referring yourself doesn't, doesn't happen that way. All right. Uh, I'll be back with two more episodes in the coming weeks as we wrap up the six episode spring season of the podcast. Have a great day. Stay safe out there.